This is actually a really hard passage. It's going to use a lot of OCHEM, a little bit of BioCHEM, but we're going to make it. Today we're going to be going through the AAMC sample test chemistry and physics passage number nine. Let's go ahead and take a look at the passage. So like always, I'm going to read through the passage. I'm going to flow chart it out. And this is going to be a pretty lengthy and involved flow chart. So it's good that you're getting a look at that. And then once I pull out the relevant basic sciences and relationships from the passage, I'm going to walk you through each question, tell you why each answer choice is correct or incorrect, and also show you how to simplify the question and make sure that you see that this test is manageable. So reading this passage, it says pantothene kinases. Well, I know what a kinase is, right? That's a basic science. I will underline that. Catalyze the phosphorylation of um, vitamin B5 to form phosphopantothenate. And it tells us that that is in figure one. Um, so first and things first is a little bit of foreshadowing if they tell me what a reaction does and then they tell me where to find it and then I go down here and it's listed precisely they actually show the mechanism of it too that tells me that it's pretty important there's probably going to be some questions on it but let's write this down so we have vitamin b5 gets phosphorylated we've got to get it's a kinase so we're getting that phosphate from ATP and it becomes I'm just going to say phospho pant we know what that is. Reading on it says that we do use ATP, and that's the first step in the biosynthesis of coenzyme A. And so that actually ends up leading us to coenzyme A. Three types of PAN-K have been identified. Oh, I did forget one really important thing. This enzyme right here that's actually making this happen is called PAN-K. Three types of PAN-K have been identified. So I'm gonna write these down because it looks like they're about to tell us what exactly each of those do and what's important about each of them. So I'm gonna go ahead and give myself a little bit of a reminder of what PAN K1, 2, and 3 are for whenever I come back to this flowchart later. So I'm just going to say 1, 2, and 3, and it tells us that PAN 2 is associated with neurodegeneration in humans, and so I'm gonna say NeuroD, PAN 1 and 3 are found in bacteria, and pink three, it's a potential target for a new antibiotics. Okay, so that seems oddly specific, but um, that's fine. I'm just gonna say back and then anti B. So notice I'm using a ton of abbreviations. This is just to trigger my brain for if I get a question that says something like, which of these would be the most effective target for, or which of these would be the least effective target for an antibiotic? The answer would obviously be number two because it has nothing to do with bacteria, right? even though number three is a common target for bacteria. Okay, then it shows us this mechanism, which is just a line diagram of what we have drawn out. So again, I skip diagrams and I just go ahead and read the figure caption, which says, this is the reaction that's catalyzed by pan -K to make coenzyme A. So again, it's just an explanation of that. Note, the compounds are shown in their non-ionized state. Oh, that's kind of weird and fishy that they told me that. That tells me that there is an ionized state. So I'm gonna keep that in my back pocket but maybe that's a little bit of foreshadowing maybe they're telling us that we're gonna have to look at these and tell them what the ionized state should be at a given pH this next paragraph says the enzyme kinetic data Ooh, we always love enzymes kinetic data it's like enzymes and kinetics Michaelis Minton and amino acids they're some of the biggest topics on the MCAT and so anytime that they throw that down my ears are perking up this data for the bacteria pink 3 are shown in Figure two, the reaction was monitored using an assay that couples the reactions of pyruvate kinase and lactate dehydrogenase. So if you don't know or you don't remember, these are enzymes associated with metabolism. It tells us that we're going to couple those two reactions. So I'm just gonna say pi K plus lactate dehydrogenase. And it says that the ATP produced by the pan K catalyzed reaction is used by pyruvate kinase to convert phosphoenone pyruvate or PEP to pyruvate. So we're kind of reaching all the way back here. They're trying to draw a line from this ADP all the way to PEP and then straight through pyruvate kinase to pyruvate. So they're really throwing it back and trying to tie everything together. And it's going to make for a messy flow chart when they do something like this, but that's the point. They're, they're wanting you to be able to mesh all these together and kind of keep up with them. And it's tough to do that in your brain, so just go ahead and write it out and draw it out. So continuing to read, it says ADP produced by this reaction. Okay, that's what we just read. The pyruvate is then converted to lactate by lactate dehydrogenase. So that's actually what they mean by this coupling. So we're going to take the pyruvate and we're going to use our lactate dehydrogenase 
and make um, with simultaneous use of NADH. Okay, so that means that one of our products is going to be NADH and lactate dehydrogenase is going to dehydrogenate it. So that means that it's going to be using that proton. It tells us that this reaction is initiated by adding um, a molar value pancake to a buffer that has kinase, dehydrogenase, some PEP, and NADH and appropriate amounts of ATP and phosphopentothate or not phosphopentothate, but pentopentothate, pantothenate. I don't care to write all these numbers down. I'm hoping that they're just there to intimidate me. Um, they are intimidating me. I'm not going to write them down. I'm not going to try to commit them to memory. I'm just going to say, okay, if I need those numbers, if I have to crank out, I don't even know, maybe you could use that for some form of faster, like the Henderson Hasselbach. Then I'll return to it, but until then, I'm not going to. It says the consumption of NADH, uh, which would be here, was measured spectrophotometrically, which that is basic science. Figure two shows the initial velocity of the reaction as a function of the initial concentration of pantothenate fitted to the michaelis minton equation. We love michaelis minton The double AMC loves it. Um, and you can see that this is following a perfect michaelis minton curve. But there's nothing here that's really a relationship, so it's not really super flowchart worthy. So we're going to read this. This is just the velocity versus pantothenate concentration at a fixed concentration of ATP. So that maybe that's something that's relevant is that the ATP is fixed, um, but really that's just kind of good science. This last paragraph says the structures of the PANK3 dimer. So uh, a lot of times they'll, they'll have sneaky questions, like they'll throw in that something is a dimer or a trimer. Um, always, always take note of those. Those are basic sciences, and they're really easy questions, and usually they like to ask about the things that hold them together. So whenever you see, see something like this, I want you to start thinking like protein structures and like is this primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary. With its substrates, pentothenate. With its product, phosphopentothenate. With both ADP and pantothenate, as well as apopank have been determined by x-ray crystallography. Okay, that's really, really wordy. All it's saying is that we looked at all these things with x-ray crystallography, and what does x-ray crystallography look at, and that's protein structure. So they're just looking at the structures of these things, and maybe they're going to try to say, um, maybe they're going to compare size differences, maybe they're going to compare some form or fashion of like charges holding them together or something like that. Let's keep reading to see if they give us any hints. These structures reveal that binding is, oh yeah, so binding, so we're focusing on that, is stabilized by interactions between C2 and C4 hydroxyl groups of the pantothenate and a carboxylate group of PANK3. PANK3. Pan okay, so I'm going to start a new flow chart here. Pantothenate has a hydroxyl group that binds to a carboxylate group of PANK3. They were really specific with it, and they use functional groups, and functional groups are pretty high yield. So that's making me think that they're going to ask us either something about the organic chemistry of it, maybe the amino acids that make them up. Um, either way, we're going to go ahead and note that because they were very hyper specific with it. And then in the tertiary or the ternary complex of PANK3 with pantothenate and ADP, the binding of ADP involves predominantly ionic interactions. Okay, so that one's kind of a little bit harder to guess what they're going for, but it does say that ADP um, binds ionically. Now this little colon, I don't know why, but the colon is what I use to mean binding. So ADP binds ionically. Now, wow, that's a... That's a flow chart and a half, right? So that's it's pretty busy. It's moving all over the place. Let's go ahead and take a look at the questions and see how they're going to test us on this stuff. We did a good job of staying with it and trying to figure out their flow. But because this passage had so many moving pieces, they're probably going to test on a lot of basic sciences or they're going to try to see if we could just hang in there with the moving pieces and, and just weather some punches. Regardless, this is a difficult passage, so let's see what they ask from it. Okay, question 47 says, what is the net charge of both pentothenate and phosphopentothenate in aqueous solution at pH 7? Okay, do you remember that thing that I mentioned might be foreshadowing earlier? Um, it was actually two for, uh, examples of foreshadowing. Whenever they were kind of redundant with this, um, this is what the reaction is, it's in figure one, then they show us figure one, and then they tell us, oh, this is the reaction. And then on top of that, they say that this is actually the compounds in their non-ionized state. So what they're asking in this question number 47 is, what are these two molecules, what is, what is, what are these two molecules ionized states? And what is their charges in those ionized states? AKA, we're looking at functional groups here. 
So what are we looking at? Pantothenate and phosphopantothenate. So let's look here. If we're looking at pantothenate, you notice that they look kind of like a line structure of like a peptide drawn out. You have this peptide bond here. And so I'm going to look and see if I notice any like amino acid R groups um, or, or even amino or carboxylate groups that are going to be charged. So I read left to right. So here is just a hydroxyl group, no charges. Methyls, no charges, no charges, no charges. And then we get all the way down to this carboxylate group. And if you remember, at physiological pH, or I think they said the pH of water here, or they said 7. So yeah, at pH of 7, though, regardless, this proton is going to be gone. So that means that this is going to be negatively charged. So I'm going to say pantothenates um, in its ionized state has a negative one charge. Then we're going to look at phosphopantothenate. So we still have this same carboxylate group, so that's a negative one there. I guess we'll read from right to left this time. Um, so no charge, no charge, no charge. Same thing here. So this whole molecule is the same here, so no differences. But then we get to this phosphate group. Now, phosphate's a really impressive molecule. It's kind of everywhere. And honestly, but you notice it has two hydroxyl groups here. These are the only places where it could possibly be missing a proton and therefore having a negative charge. So I'm going to say that both of these are going to lose a proton and have a negative charge, meaning this whole molecule is going to be a negative three. Now, the question that might pop up is, well, how come these hydroxyls are losing charge or losing protons and be being charged and then this hydroxyl group is not? Well, a lot of it has to do with the pKa. If you look up the pKa of carboxylate, and this phosphate group, you'll notice that they are below seven, meaning that they're gonna lose a proton group for some of their protons. However, phosphate's pKa, I know it has one pKa, one of these hydrogens is going to be lower than seven, but I think one of them is right around seven. And so what, what makes these pKa's different for these protons that are attached to these oxygens is the ability for the negative charge to resonate throughout the molecule locally. So you would notice that these electrons, after, after we remove this hydrogen, we'll have these electrons that are gonna be a negative one charge. Well, these electrons could come down, they could double bond here, or they could go here, or they could go here. So they have a lot of resonance, and that's going to make the molecule more willing to donate the proton if it knows that its electrons are going to be taken care of once the proton leaves. So that's kind of what makes things that look very similar have different pKa's. So that's one of the reasons. There's there's there are actually a bunch, you know, whether it be resonance, um, anything that's going to affect stability, sterics, and even your location and your makeup of the protein will actually locally change your pKa values. But you want to know all that for the MCAT. So. It's possible that this has a negative three charge. So it looks like we're looking for something with pantothenate at a negative one and phosphopantothenate at a negative three. So let's see if we can get their answer. So this says that they're both neutral. If you did not notice that it said non-ionized state, maybe you go back and you see that neither one of them are ionized in, this, in that diagram. So you pick A, but we know that they're both ionized. Um, so maybe not. B, we know that pantothenate is negative one. So I like B, but we know that phosphopantothenate is it's it has more negative charges than just one even if you're a little bit nervous about saying that both of these are negatively charged you know that at least one of them is so i'm going to rule out b c is exactly what we were going for so maybe to c and then d says that pantothenate has three negative charges the way that you get to answer choice d is if you think that every single hydroxyl group is donating a proton so that's how you get to answer choice d but we just kind of talked about what would make that true because if or, yeah, we just kind of talked about why that's false, because if you donate these protons, this electron is not going to go down here. It's not going to work very well, because if those electrons jump down there, then it's going to mess up the entire molecule downhill. So that's why the pKa is a little bit higher. So maybe not to D, and our correct answer is answer choice C. Yeah, that's a tough question. The next one's pretty hard, too. So we're going to look at 48. It says, what are the components that comprise coenzyme A? figure one. Briefly glancing at these answer choices, it's got a bunch of crap that I have no clue what they look like. So I'm going to identify what I do know. Okay, I know what these look like because they're in the passage, they're in the diagram, and then I also know how to tell a difference between these. 
So I'm not going to worry about beta mercaptopropylamine or versus ethylamine. You can probably tell it because they have the same thing. It's just a difference between a purple group versus an ethyl group. But I'm not really going to worry about that because there are enough differences in just these two columns alone for me to get to my right answer. So let's go through here. I'm going to look and see if coenzyme A has a phosphopantothenate or a pantothenate. And then I'm going to rule out answer choices based on that. So looking at coenzyme A, it looks like that group would be around here-ish. That looks the most similar to pantothenate and phosphopantothenate. Er, yeah, pantothenate and phosphopantothenate. Now you notice, even though we've replaced our OH or our carboxylate group with an SH, you notice that this molecule looks a lot more like pantothenate, namely because it's not directly connected to a phosphate group. So I can rule out anything with phosphopantothenate, so no to A and C. Do notice that we are connected to these phosphates here, but the question lies in, are these phosphates part of this original molecule or are they part of this molecule, which is attached to an adenosine? It's a lot more likely that they're going to be attached to an adenosine, right? Because we can think of a MP, a DP, an ATP. But that right there was the trick. That was the tricky part of the question. So the next thing is, now we're just deciding, are we dealing with an AMP or an ADP? Or are we dealing with DAMPs and we made a mistake earlier? So let's go ahead and look at it. The easiest thing to do is to check the DAMP versus the AMP. The way we can do that is D stands for deoxy, and that means that this carbon here will not have an oxygen attached to it. But you notice that it does. And so we can rule out DAMP. It's not DAMP. So we're either dealing with AMP or ADP. The way that you tell AMP versus ADP, M means mono, D means di. We're just going to count phosphates here. How many phosphates are connected? We've got one and we've got two. So that means that we are dealing with ADP, and the only answer choice that has ADP is answer choice D. So whenever you read this question, you think you have to know a ton. Really, all you had to do was just be able to identify ADP, because it's the only one there. Now, I want you to know all the sciences, but this is not a required science for the MCAT. Yes, knowing some of these nomenclatures that are going to allow you to identify the molecule are going to help. Being able to problem solve and rule out answer choices is going to pay dividends in the long run. So if you got the answer knowing the proper sciences, that's amazing. But think about how you can apply this to the rest of your studies. And if you got the answer correct using this process of elimination, that's awesome too. Now let's go ahead and learn those sciences so that we have two ways to get every question correct. That way, if you kind of have a brain fart on a, on a fact, that you can problem solve to it. And if you're tired or you're rushed, you don't have to take the time to problem solve. You just know the fact. So 49 says the stabilization of pantothenate and pan 3 is most likely due to an active site what? So we actually talked about this. We said that um, pan th this is just saying what's in pan 3s active site that's participating in the binding. So we talked about this. We said that panto has a hydroxyl group that binds to the carboxylate group of PANK3. So we're looking for something that's got an R group with this carboxylate group. Because the active site is the R group of the amino acid. So now our question just turns into which of these amino acids has a carboxylate group in their R group. Much, much easier than what they gave us. That's why simplifying the question works so well. So going through these answer choices, A is arginine. Arginine does not have a carboxylate group. Remember, it's the long one with the with the nitrogens, so maybe not A. It's, is, is it an amine group? Arginine is. Asparagine, or that's the one that has the one carbon, and then it has the oxygens and the nitrogens, so maybe not asparagine because that's not a carboxylate group, right? We're looking for something like this. Aspartate does have a carboxylate group. You're either looking for aspartate or glutamate here if you're looking for this guy. So maybe to see, and then D says glutamine. Glutamine or asparagine have very similar R groups. The only difference is the amount of carbons between the carbon amino group and the rest of the amino acid backbone. Um, glutamine has two, asparagine has one, and 
the way you're, I always remember that is you've got two glutes. So the correct answer here is answer choice C, aspartate. Simplify the question as much as you can. It is the hardest skill to learn, but it is the skill that's going to make this test manageable. And honestly, if you can do this skill and you can learn how to do this, it makes medical school substantially easier. This is what people can do whenever they say that they are a, quote, good test taker. They read questions and they organize them in their brain. So focus on this strategy. If you do nothing else, learn how to do this and flow charting. Question number 50 says, these amino acids, and it lists a couple, are found near the ADP binding site of PANK3. Which two amino acids contribute to the stabilization of ADP binding described in the passage? So this is another question asking about the binding. So first I'm going to say, okay, well, what did the passage tell me about ADP's binding? Do you remember we wrote it down? We said that it binds ionically. Okay, so what, what does that mean? I, an ionic bond, right? is plus and a negative so a positive and a negative charge coming together um, or at least that's what you're going to need to make an ionic bond because an ionic bond is one in which you're donating electrons so okay you're looking for one positive and one negative what do you have to start with what does ADP have well remember we talked about this earlier These phosphate groups are going to be negatively charged at physiological pH so that means you've already got the negative charge. You just need the positive. That's all we want, and we'll be happy. So, now my question becomes, which of these two amino acids are positively charged at physiological pH? Hmm. A, does asparagine and threonine, those are both neutral. B says histidine and arginine, and those are both characteristically learned as positively charged amino acid in a protein. So I like B. C says aspartate, that's negative, so no, arginine is positive. And then B also says aspartic acid, they're both negative even though histidine is positive. So no, no, so B is the correct answer there. Simplifying the question really works wonders. And then the last one, number 51, what is the fate of the NADH used in the assay described in the passage? And then they're just talking about, does NADH get reduced or oxidized. Remember your mnemonic oil rig, oxidation is loss of electrons, reduction is gain of electrons. So this right here would be a loss of electrons, right? So we're gonna go back and see what NADH is doing in our passage. Looks like NADH is turning into NAD+. The way that you do that is by losing electrons. If you are going to get a positively charged, protons do not move, but electrons do. So you lose electrons and that loss of a negative charge leads to a positive charge. So if we're losing electrons, then we are oxidizing. We know we're going from NADH to NAD+. So that means our correct answer is answer choice A. Thanks for watching the video. I'll see you in the next one.